Hello, my name is Michael Coyne. I was born in Connemona, County Galway in 1945 and May 23rd. It was a Celtic area and uh, I went to school for the since the time I was five till I was eight. And when I was eight, we moved up to Jenkins Town, Kilcock County Mead. And we had a dairy farm. And when I was six, 16, nearly 17, I moved to New York for three weeks to my aunt, my father's sister, and stayed visiting around the Empire State Building and other spots. Uh, after three weeks, I moved to Chicago to my uncle, my mother's brother, and I got a job, he got me a job with an Italian gardener. We went around the suburbs and all of that, cutting grass. And after about three months, he got me an, another job for a furrier, an Irish furrier. And uh, spent the next four years doing fashion shows and working with furs and all of that kind of thing. And uh, in that period, I, was, I got a call. I, when I was 18, I had to sign up for the draft, basically. And uh, I did that, and two years later, I got a call up for selective service. And I went in Van Buren Street, is wh where they were taking the men, or others, I should say. I showed up anyway, and uh, my boss, the furrier, got me off the first time for his own interest. I, uh, I, I came back and back to work, and a couple of months later, I got called up again. I knew it would be a regular thing every three months anyway. So showed up again, and told me again, you go back, you're going back to work, you're not going, to, going in today. I said, no, I want to go, I says. I want to get it over with, which I did. Because you, you're doing up a bad record if you kept trying to dodge it. You know what I mean? And uh, right, the captain, he was there, he says, you're in. So I was in, went down to Kentucky, the first night on a train from Chicago. About a third of the guys that was in basic training were from Chicago and the surrounding areas in Illinois. And we went down to Fort Campbell in Kentucky for two weeks. And that time they were just like it was indoctrination and getting measures for uniforms, pulling teeth and all that kind of stuff, haircuts. After two weeks there, they picked out people and called out your name, and I was one of them anyway. There was once going down to Fort Stewart in Georgia. So the guys from the, the Illinois area, they all went down to Georgia with me. Some of them, some of the rest, like they went elsewhere. And when we got down there, there was another batch that came in from New Jersey, another company, the, the just recruit company, training company, and another batch from Tennessee. Now, the training was basic. It was just everybody knows what it is, probably. It's watched ever watch TV. It's just basic training and use how to gun and all that kind of stuff. 
And then when that was finished, that was eight weeks. That was six weeks down there for your basic training because we had two weeks up in Fort Campbell already. And then when you graduated from that, they would assign you based on IQ tests and all that, they'd assign you what you'd be good at or what they wanted you for. I was assigned to the engineers for whatever reason or no. Anyway, in, that was advanced training, right? And the first day that I was assigned to this, we had a, all the engineers were called together and all that, or so, to be engineers or whatever. And the sergeant said, need two, in, two volunteers for staff, he says. Now the pattern was in the army, you'd never volunteer for anything. That was, anyway, I, I wasn't, I says, I'll volunteer for whatever it is. And another guy did, he was from Chicago too. And he, he was told first, you're going down to flight engineering, flight air traffic control, that they train them for that. And you're going to film projection school to me. And I wasn't sure what that was all about. But I did the course on anyway. it was only, as far as I remember, three or four weeks. In, Film projection and learning where the films were and going through the film library and all this, how to do the, how to run the projector and other, I forget what they call them now, projector, flat screen projectors, still projectors or something. And I went around the base showing training films. They'd give me a slip of paper when they wanted me to do it. And they told me, go, it was all down in the conference room anyway, that's where all the films were shown. And they were about, basically, about hygiene and army stuff, army morale, and do what you're told stuff. And war, whatever you call it, ide ideology. That means that you just really, you have to do what you're told <laughs> and you'll pass. <laughs> but anyway, I did that. And then while I was doing that, I was talking to some other guys in the film library and that who just had, had come back from Vietnam mm. and they'd worked on films over there. And mm. just told me it was dead handy, you know, all that. So I went down to the office and that was in Fort Stewart. I told the sergeant I wanted to volunteer to go to Vietnam. And he said, no problem. He said, I knew that would be no problem because they were looking for guys to do it all the time. And then a couple of days later, he came back to me and says, you're not a citizen. He says, I'm going to have to send up to Washington to get your clearance. I knew there'd be no problem there either, because <laughs> I'd seen others, you know what I mean? And I was back, oh, you're clear. And then they gave me 30 days off or something like that. I'm not sure how long it was, 30 days maybe. And uh, I went up, up to Chicago and around that, and my brother, all that. Patrick, and he, anyway, after that 30 days was up, I had a flight out to Tacoma, Washington. And from there, a couple of days later, a flight to Cameron Bay in Vietnam. I landed down at Cameron Bay and the heat was just something else. But uh, anyway, in the morning they were calling people out and 
I didn't get up the first time, but in the second time I didn't. They told me I was going up to Black Horse. Didn't know what that was either. And that evening got on a helicopter and were flown up to me and two other guys. Got flown up to Swan Lock. That's where the Black Horse Space Camp was. That's what Black Horse is. It was the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment Base Camp. They were building it at the time. And uh, when I got there, the colonel, I think, was, I don't know if I remember, it was Jack McFarland, I think. But he uh, asked what we were and all that, what, this guy and that. And uh, the rest were tankers, I think, I'm not sure. They asked me, and I said, uh, film projectionist. He didn't know what to, where to put me at the time, I think, really. So he just said, you'd be my driver for the mean to meantime. That was driving his Jeep around the base, and that was it, really, basically. That lasted a couple of weeks. And then, uh, well, in that time, I bought a camera, a film camera, Super, uh, no, not a super, a f eight millimeter film camera in a Korean exchange, PX or whatever it was. It was on the base. And I thought it would be handy because probably I got the notion in, during film projection and all of that, it certainly put something in my head to want to do it. A lot of people ask me why did I, how did I, what provoked me or whatever. I was then, I was put on a track that's a, a, 113 as a scout. Because on my records it, it showed that I was, I could speak two languages. Now, I couldn't speak Vietnamese anyway. <laughs> and uh, so I think that's why it put me in the scouts because what I was doing would be, what I was meant to be doing would be to get down and check things out and talk to people, and, which I ended up doing anyway, actually, although it was off a tank. A couple of days, a couple of weeks later, I was put on a tank. Danny Klein, he was from Texas, he was the tank commander. And Harold Kilo was the driver. And Donald Fisher was the loader. And normally, a four man crew on the tank, that's what's. Now, they didn't, we didn't use the gun sights or anything like that at all. It was more shotgun type stuff. So the, gun, the gunner, that was the, what they called the gunner, was replaced by the job he had. He was put on the back deck with an M60 machine gun, a whole array of weapons, an armory of stuff. And I did that job on the tank. I did the loader on the tank. This is over different periods. I come off the tank and scouted when they needed somebody to scout. And I drove a tank. We operated mainly along f out of Swan Lock and up along the Cambodian border. Highway 13, all that way, up through the jungles and all that. Months of it. We were up in the Cambodian border somewhere, uh, 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 Lac Nen. The Tet Offensive broke out. We all had to race down to 
say gone on that area, then go out somewhere. We fought our way up there through the Hobo Woods, up to all up there. And when we got up there, we had to fight our way back down again. They were everywhere. And we got down, I don't know, but down 12. It was a hundred and something miles anyway. Tanks were left burning and you name it. And then we moved back down to Swanlock area. And uh, the 19th of February, that was just after the, the February, that was two weeks later, like up, we were up and down every battle that we were called into nearly every battle, every day that was going on. On the 19th of February, we were in a convoy and we, me, we were the first tank leading the convoy. And we came to this culvert that was south of Swan Lock, about five miles out there, something like that. And Danny Kleins pulled the tank up anyway, and basically we discussed it as we used to, like, what's up here? And we decided, or he did, he, he made the decision, or somebody else decided higher up, that the engineers would be called in to do two, minesweep the area. And while, while we were waiting for the mine-sweeping engineers to come up, they started to sweep the area. And I was standing up on the tank on the back deck, looking down at us. We were just only about 10 feet away of what happened. And his name was Shan. I'll never forget his name because an Irish name. And he was a captain in military intelligence. He came up and he was warned that not to go any further, the road hadn't been mine swept yet. And at that time, at the same time, I could hear radio communications urging them to get a move on. A lot of pressure to move up to where whatever was the aim and objective of getting to. And he says, uh, I didn't take all this training in the States for nothing. And he, he, he went up, walking up, because he, he was under a lot of pressure. I told his son when he inquired about it. And he went up, and then he stopped, and he was looking down at something. I remember just thinking to myself, he's looking at, he's seen something. Next thing, he kicks it, kicks the whatever he was looking at. He went about a hundred feet in the air. All that was left, all that we could find, although maybe later on, sorts of might have found more, was the heel of his boot. And then we moved out from there, and I heard later that. They found other parts, but anyway. Then we went back up again to a place called Bodap, up on the kind of Cambodian border again. Fought our way up there again. We were in this, at Bodap somewhere, in the jungle, and the lieutenant came to me, which the tanks were stopped, and asked me to go with them. And they got Smitty. He was on the tank one, two. He was the, at the time, he was also the back deck gunner. And he says, I need you to carry a radio. We go up 200 meters up into the jungle and check out a, a fork up here on the trail. 
So I got the radio and put it on and all that knows. I was the only private. I was a private first class, lowest rank anyway. Smithy was a E5 or E4, I'm not sure. And the lieutenant, he was the officer. And we go on up into the jungle. The tanks were back behind, left behind and the personnel carriers. And we get up to this fork in the trail and we stop. Smitty was in front of me, to my left. The lieutenant was in front of me, to my right. I was standing behind both of them. And the lieutenant turned around and he asked me to check out that fork over to the left. I was pulling down the antenna to do it. Smitty instantly, he didn't even give me a time to respond. He says, I'll check it out, I'll do it. Jumps up and out. He only got from here to, to where you are sitting, more or less, this blast. And his legs were left standing there. Top half of his body was gone. I'll never, it was vivid, never forget it. Never, it was, must have been so quick that it just sliced through. And then the legs fell. And uh, me and the lieutenant got down. Next thing, the tanks behind us opened up. And they were firing everything, as far as I know, because the whole jungle around us just collapsed. Lieutenant Reed was there right next to me. He, he, he can verify that, but I don't know what his side of it is. But anyway, when the shooting stopped, we went back and had to report all of that and... Oh yeah, when it happened, the explosion threw all kinds of stuff around, like... I thought it was a, tw a piece of tree or bamboo that was stuck in my arm here. I pulled it out to look at it, it was actually part of his rib cage. And, uh, yeah, we reported it all to the day quiz and all that, what happened then. Uh, we, uh, then, moved out again. Moved back down to, uh, that was April, April the 16th when he got killed and we were up on the Cambodian border. Yeah, while we were up there, or on the way up there, on the way back, I'm not sure which, one day I was on the tank and a chaplain came up to me. I didn't know who he was or anything because... Um, but he says, you're a Catholic, aren't you? Coin. I says, yeah. He said, uh, do you know any prayers? Do you know how to say any prayers? I says, yeah. I says, I know how to say the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, maybe. That kind of thing. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's good enough. And we go off up into the jungle again. This is, an, I'm not sure what the date was, but it happened anyway. And one pit, I think it was 14, the one the, the Catholic priest and myself were praying over. And then there was another pit, I don't know how many was in it. And uh, another preacher, chaplain, was praying. And he, the Catholic priest, I, I don't know if I, I'm not sure if I asked or not, but he told me anyway that they were the Protestants, we were the Catholics. 
quicklime into the, it was a pit on quicklime. I, I, I'm not sure where we were. I don't know if we were in Cambodia, but the reason that they, they were buried that, like there was it couldn't be got out yeah, without losing maybe a whole lot more, I don't know. 13th of April, I'm not sure where we were, but we were down, further down towards Saigon anyway. Hainai, maybe somewhere like that. But anyway, we drove into a minefield. In, leading it in was some armored personnel carriers went in there. And I remember when we were following in, to get them out, so to speak, after they hit a mine or two tracks. There was all kinds of them, all kinds of them were killed. And I had to get down to help get it. He was from, he told me his belly was out, ripped out. He asked me, was he going to die on that? And I said, no. But I wasn't that, that I, I, I really don't know if he survived or not. He was from Ohio. I think it was Columbus, he says, I'm not sure. But uh, he was picked up in a helicopter and taken away. But that was the most fearful time of, I ever remember made me afraid of walking in the minefield, every step I took. And then I went back to the tank, got up on the tank, and as I was getting up on the tank, Sergeant Gorris was on another tank, one four. Oh, before I got up on the tank, he was on the ground and his, he was hitting the chest with shrapnel, and, of blood pouring out. And then I got up on the tank and Fisher got hit in the back with shrapnel from mines going off and all that. Anyway, I don't, don't remember how we got out of that field, but we got out of it somehow anyway, but a whole lot of people were got in, killed and injured. That could all be checked out, like, to go close enough records, because of people killed and all that. And then, we were moving somewhere down to somewhere else, along that, on the way down, again. Duck Wa, Duck How, Duck Wa, that's one of the places we ended up around that time, not ended up, but we, we, I remember. A bus got blown up. Those bodies scattered all over the place. I had to get down and I remember walking around among the, the, the people. What it amazed me was, none of them were crying out or anything. They were just some shock, I suppose. Legs are gone, you name it. The 30th of May, that was in the vicinity of Dukwa. I got purple heart, three purple hearts in that period, in them three months. I wondered three times, it just in them three months. Yeah, Dukwa, there was, four armored personnel carriers in a battle, and they got nine wounded crewmen on them. All the tanks that we were on were, were run out of ammo and all that, and we were stuck in a rice paddy. The ca I took some film on the scene that day, uh, among other days, where I'd taken film of where we were. And after that, the captain said he needed some volunteers. There was only two or three of us around anyway. Two that weren't injured or dead. 
And we need volunteers to go out and get nine wounded crewmen off of these four assault vehicles that are about 200 feet yards ahead. And he looked at me, that meant three really that I volunteered, which I did. And I think it was Francis Hennigan, but I'm not sure. Because he got wounded on the 13th. He got a Purple Heart for the 13th of, of May. So he might have been somebody else that went with me, but whoever went with me, running with me that day, got shot also. And he went down. And uh, the machine guns were zeroing in on us and all of the bullets flying everywhere. And uh, this is all in dispatch and all like. Uh, I'm, I said, said to him, I'm going to have to go on at us, and I did. And I ran out and I got out there. And was, I think there was, well, according to, to the, the report, along with me, there was two others there. But there had to be some there, but it was so, I cannot. We carried anyway the, all, all the bodies, not, not the bodies, no, we ca carried all the wounded, the nine wounded, though some of them were dead, not the nine weren't dead but there was others dead. And we got them onto one track and drove it back and got them out. Now, I don't know what happened to any of them or any of their names because they were, I think they were B Troop. I'm not sure, but that could be easily determined anyway. And I got a, a, a brand star and a V device for that. And a purple heart because I got shot in the arm also. But I didn't, it, it was just a deep graze, it didn't affect me what I was doing. Then we, I think we went back to the base camp then for about a couple of weeks, maybe. Not even that, a week maybe. We were out in the jungle and I got sick as a dog. And I caught malaria. But I didn't know it was malaria, but I knew it was deadly because I was just so sick and all oh, that passing out. They called in a helicopter. The helicopter dropped down to pick me up through the jungle. I was on a stretcher and all that and picked up and flown to Long Ben Hospital. When I got there, still as sick as a dog, headache and fever, and they took a blood test and it didn't show malaria because I didn't know this either, but I was told later that it goes, it cocoons and comes back. It comes in periods, and it didn't show on that one. That's according to them, anyway. So they flew me back out to the f jungle. I passed out out there, semi, semi conscious, that's all. Called in the helicopter again. That's twice I was helicopter out of the jungle. Back into the hospital. Took the test again, and I had the worst type of malaria. Right. And the temperature, the, I have all the records because I got all my records. 105, that had me in ice packs and everything. That was on the 1st of July. I was the second time I was thrown back in to the hospital. Semi coma for the I woke up, and this is a fact, on the 4th of July. They have it on the records and everything when they were giving me the stuff. And then I was in the hospital there for, I don't know, maybe a month. Then they flew me to a hospital in Tachikawa, Japan. I think it was Tachikawa. Spent a 
week or two there. Then I was flown to Alaska. I was in a hospital up in Alaska. White Horse, White, I'm not sure what's the name of the place. And a couple of weeks up there, I remember was the, the cool air was, the weather was just lovely up there. It was, I think it was just, and then that'd be in July probably. No, be maybe August. And then I was flo I went flown down from Alaska to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. And I was in a hospital in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania until the 29th of August. That's when I got out. I remember walking the corridors, miles and miles of corridors. And every injury imaginable. I, I was lucky, like, compared to what I'd seen, seen there. And uh, then all of a sudden I got called in and said, you're going out tomorrow. I said, oh, great. I said, that's fine. I want to go. But it turned out anyway, I was on the 29th. I got out on the 29th of August for Chicago. At the same time at that time, Democratic National Convention and riots were going on in Chicago. Anyway, found there was no welcome in America. After a year in Vietnam, I knew that everybody had seen me, as soon as looked at us in Vietnam, they did not like us. When we got back from Vietnam, they did not like us either. <laughs> That's a fact. And, yeah, I went to, back to work for a four year again. And did a few fashion shows and all that for a while. And while I was in Vietnam, his son, his oldest son, got killed in a car accident. Could never come to terms how I could survive Vietnam and his son gets killed in a car accident. But anyway, it's another story. Uh, after a while, I went down to my brothers in South Bend, Indiana, and we went down to Florida. Went to work in. I went to work as a bus driver first for a couple of weeks and then I got a job at the airport as a white paper electrician. And worked there. Then after a year, come back to Ireland anyway and working at Dublin Airport, Paddy Lynch Electrical. Maybe two years, a year or two. Then I went to England and went out to Saudi Arabia, worked out there for about nine months in the oil fields, working in the power stations and that. Then uh, spent a while in the Merchant Navy, British Merchant Navy, as an electrician on ship. Then I worked in England again for my seven years. Building sites, electrician and all that. And uh, came back to Ireland again and. 1979, worked for CIE in Shakur for five years, had an accident, having a 
Lord sons. That's about it. <laughs>